Civil War strategies. And what we're looking at here are the strategies between the North and the South in the American Civil War, or in other words, the United States of America versus the Confederate States of America. First thing I would like for us to notice the chart here, and this chart is going to provide us advantages on the left for the North and disadvantage for the North on the right. The first advantage that the North has is its population, and its population is seen here. And one will notice there's an extreme advantage for the North. In the United States in the year 1860, there was approximately 31 and a half million people. In the North, 22 million of these individuals lived there. However, in the South, the South had approximately nine and a half million people. But of that nine and a half, four million were enslaved Americans who were ineligible to fight in the war. So the North has an extreme advantage there. The North also has an advantage in terms of transportation. The vast majority of all railroads existed in the North. And this is due to uh, the rail, railroads and factories. Factories were connected by these railroads and thus the vast majority of them existed there. The value of, pr of produ production also falls to the north and 98% of all shipping is going on in the north as well. So huge advantage there. Now the north is also going to find themselves in a circumstance where money is going to be a huge advantage for them. And by this I'm looking up here in the upper left, and this has to do with war finances. This war is going to cost about $2 billion for the North, but for the South, it's going to be $3 billion plus another $2.8 billion in interest alone. And what's interesting here is this borrowed money is actually going to come from Northern bankers. So the, the South is going to borrow its money from the North to finance the war, sort of an odd circumstance. And last and finally, supplies. And supplies are going to be a huge advantage for the North as well. But if we look here at supplies, um, the supplies for the, for the North is going to come in the form of cattle, tobacco, corn, wheat, and wool, and the wool actually is made into their uniforms. The South's advantage is going to be predominantly in cash crops. However, where the South is going to have some advantages we're going to see here is the fact that they're going to be defending their homes. Most of this war will be fought in the South. The biggest advantage they're going to have, which we're going to see in a moment, is the leadership of Robert E. Lee. The South also has a strong military tradition. The vast majority of the United States leaders in the military were from the South, so they're going to be fighting for the South. And this war will ultimately become an extended war, which is going to fall into the hands of the South and be an advantage for them. Now when we look at the leadership of the North and South, the Army of Virginia is the army that is going to dominate for the South, and they begin the war with the leadership of a man here by the name of Joseph E. Johnston. He'll be wounded early in the war, and as a result, the leadership is going to then go to Robert E. Lee. And Robert E. Lee was even Abraham Lincoln's choice to command the Army of the North, but as we recall, he waited for Virginia and then became a Confederate when Virginia seceded. He is the number one pick, not just by Abraham Lincoln, but by the South as well. And he's going to be a huge advantage. Now, just to substantiate or show further the advantage that the South had in leadership, let's take a look here at the commanding generals for the North, which is called the Army of the Potomac. And the Army of the Potomac is going to start with this gentleman here, the colored photo, and this is Winfield Scott. He is going to create the plan for the North, but he retires early on in the war and thus never really commands any troops. When he retires, the person that takes over is going to be this gentleman here by the name of Henry Halleck. And Henry Halleck was nicknamed Old Brains. He's going to be kind of the strategist behind this, but he's not a very good general in terms of commanding troops. So for this reason, 
he'll be set aside and be sort of the brains of the operation. But this gentleman right here is going to be George McClellan, and he's going to lead the troops. Now, McClellan will remain in place, but he will, as Lincoln say, have the slows. And so he's going to fall upon Irvin McDowell to move troops, but Irvin McDowell loses the first actual battle of this war, the Battle of Bull Run, and he is relieved from duty, and McClellan then takes over completely. When McClellan is there, he is going to actually be in control, but for a short time, a person by the name of Pope is going to command troops for a while because of McClellan's inability to move troops speedily, as Lincoln believed. Now, Pope will be here until he loses the second battle at Bull Run, and he'll be removed, and then McClellan re will return to command, and McClellan will remain there until McClellan lo doesn't lose the Battle of Antietam, but it's a terrible, horrific battle, and we're going to lose the largest number of American troops in one day, the bloodiest day in American history at Antietam. And in doing so, Abraham Lincoln finally relieves McClellan from duty and replaces him with an individual by the name of Ambrose Burnside. And Burnside will remain here until he loses the battle at Fredericksburg. And then he is removed from duty. And when that happens, this guy here, Joseph Hooker, he is provided command of the army, but he ends up resigning just prior to the Battle of Gettysburg. And at the Battle of Gettysburg, George Meade is going to take over control. And the Battle of Gettysburg is considered the turning point of the war, but Meade lost an opportunity to finally defeat Robert E. Lee and end the war in 1863. And Lincoln is dissatisfied with his leadership, so he removes him. And ultimately, we end up with Ulysses S. Grant. And he will be the commanding general of the Army of the Potomac until this war is over. But one thing I want us to notice here in all of this is that Abraham Lincoln, seen here, he will have a serious problem with commanding generals, of finding that leader that can lead the United States to victory. In terms of the plans for the war, the original plan was created, as we said, by General Winfield Scott. And it was nicknamed the Anaconda Plan. And this is because the goal of this plan, as seen down here, is to um, basically surround the South. And the goal is, by creating this use of the Navy to surround the South and control the Mississippi River here, one will bottle up or strangle the South like an anaconda uh, reptile and strangle its victim. Now the goal here, while it seems like an, a good plan, and this is the capital area here, uh, it seems like a great plan. The problem is, is this is going to make the war last a long time. So this plan falls into the hands of Robert E. Lee. Now, when we look at this plan, there are four essentials to it. The first one is the blockade, as we said, control of the Mississippi, capture the Tennessee River Valley and march through Georgia, and eventually capture Richmond, the capital of the Confederate States of America. Robert E. Lee's plan is very different. And this is kind of a plan that was created by George Washington to fight a defensive war, to never, ever sort of give up. And this defensive war strategy by Robert E. Lee is going to prove to be very, very effective. Uh, we're going to see that he will have opportunity to maybe take advantage of the North and possibly win this war with inferior troops and um, numbers, etc. Um, but he's going to end up uh, losing the war because of some moves that he makes later on. Ultimately, this is the strategies of the war. 